Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Midweek Takeaway. We're joined by Saf and Guy, CCO of Sovereign Metals and Charles Archer, investor and analyst. Welcome both. Hi, yeah. Hi, Phil. Hi, Charles. Yeah, so Charles, you, you recently updated your written article around sovereign metals. So please give us your thoughts and, and use the chance and opportunity to ask any questions of Safan. Over to you, Charles. I uh, no, well, let's start at the start. I mean, the first the first article that I put out on sovereign metals, it was trading around 22, 22 and a half P back in December. We're now up to 36 P a share. So it's gone up about 50 percent, which Safan, you must be pretty happy about. Look, I think uh, the market's slowly understanding exactly what we have our hands on here at Sia. It is a tier one deposit. It's you know once in a generation find. I think previously, when we've talked titanium, rutile, graphite, and then you know say that th- those commodities are in one ore body and that ore body is in Malawi, it's uh, ended up glazing a lot of eyes in the audience. Mm. But I think yeah. over time, people are understanding. Yes, these are critical minerals. These are products that you know the, the world is looking out for. They are imperative to decarbonization to. A defense to aerospace to our our daily daily lives, and so you're seeing a lot more people understanding just what we have at Casia, which is which which is good to see. I mean, it, it seems that Rio Tinto, uh, your major investor, has decided that you you know you're on the right lines. We we saw today that they've invested in an additional eighteen point five million Australian dollars. And a few you know a few days before that that option ran out. I guess that kind of signifies to the market potentially just how big this deposit is, just how important it is globally. For us as a management team, look, what it signifies is everything that Rio Tinto has seen on site within the midst of our own team, working alongside us on the on the technical side, as well as the social side, the environmental side. It's clearly ticked all the boxes so far. It kind of validates what we've been doing over the last mm. while, was it since Rio came in? Yeah, we, well, it is very interesting, isn't it? I mean, obviously, uh, this is something that long-term investors wanted to see. But, in, you know, but beyond that, beyond Rio Tento and its investment, I mean, obviously, the big thing that's going on at the moment is the pilot plant. I've had a look at, you know, on the photos on Twitter, this thing looks pretty massive to me, you know, just working with junior explorers. And yet it's only roughly, you know, maybe five or, you know, at most 10% of what the actual mine is going to look like once it's built. How's the pilot plant coming along at the moment? Yeah, it's all on schedule, all on track, on budget. We have dug out the the demo pits, uh, the rehab pits. We've dug out the wood storage ponds that's now being filled. Get on our social media and see all those pictures and videos that we mm. we try to post right. at least once a week uh, to keep everyone abreast of that. Uh, and you're right, it looks pretty impressive. It looks pretty big, but it's it's a reminder of the size of uh, mm. Sierra when you think. You know, let's do the maths. We're we're moving 150,000 cubic meters over three months, so that's about 600,000 meters uh, cubic meters for the year. Each cubic meter is about two and a half uh, tons. So in total, we're moving about one and a half million tons for on an annualized basis. We envisage steady state mining 24 million tons. So look at the pilot plant. No, sorry, the pilot mining pictures. Do look at those images. Multiply it by. 15, 16, 17 in your head, and you, you, you'll get an idea of the size and scale of Casilla when it's yeah, up. Well, it's massive, isn't it? I mean, this is this is the thing. I think if you're uh, people investing in junior explorers would look at your pilot plant and go, wow, that's the real thing. That, and I think it's really important to highlight, this is not the real thing. This is just test work, do you know? And it's amazing to me that something of that size is just effectively due diligence on the deposit that you're doing because it, it's not like you're, you're not planning on using that pilot plant to generate you know masses of revenue the idea is to to better understand what you have and then build the bigger thing in the future right correct look you don't approach well if you if you've done your homework and you've been there done that plenty of times as much of our um, as much as our management team have you don't turn up to a tier one deposit on day one and say right let's start building this thing out <laughs> If you do have the cash in the bank and you have the wherewithal to find the financing, you just don't do that, right? You you want to understand what does it actually mean to mine this? What's the best permutation of mining it? What's the best combination of hydro and dry mining? What does it mean to backfill the material? You know, we're, we're essentially very simply, we're taking out this soil from the top 20 odd meters. We're taking out 1% of it in the form of rutile and we're separating 1.5% of it in the form of graphite flakes, which is mm. our product. 
and the rest of it goes back to where it was. But yeah. obviously, process did a bit. So is it going to backfill completely? No, we'll need some kind of ta tailing storage uh, solution. And you get that solution by pilot mining. You don't get it by, you know, <laughs> yeah. start off mining and then figuring this thing out. Figuring out later on. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that it, obviously there's a, like with this deposit, there's no crushing, there's no blasting. It does seem to me kind of count, well, I mean, counterintuitive, maybe not the right word, but the point of the pilot plant is to see if there's any problems, right? So you almost want to see no problems at the same time, see a few so that you can preempt them for the future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Look, we're, we're, this is the reason why we're, we've got, if you if you go online and you see the demo pits, we've got seven different demo pits. And what we're doing is putting a different combination of different types of backfill material into those pits, as well as different ways that we're processing the actual uh, the, the actual minerals, and we're seeing what's best. You know? And 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 obviously, what we learn in that part of Casia is specific to that part of Casia. It won't be a complete carbon copy wherever we go on the kind of two hundred square kilometers of of of, of mineralization, but. It lets us understand, uh, depending on the type of uh, mineral that we're, you know, the type of material that we're mining, uh, what to expect, and uh, and 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 if there are any kind of potential issues that we can overcome them before we even stick stick the spade in the ground. Which is exactly what you know you want to hear as a long term investor. I mean, on, on the third of June, Sam Dolan from the ASX, or so Australian Securities Exchange, he sent you know effectively just sent a little email saying why is the share price shooting up so high. And you sent something back as well, not you personally, but the company sent something back. You know, like, and my interpretation was it was people were finally realizing what we have here. You know, there's no specific reason why it's rocketing higher. And yet it keeps going up and up. I mean, do, do you think we're kind of just at the start now of the share price? Or do you do you, do you think it's going to plateau for a little bit? No, I think so. I think there's, you know, the, the, the reality is, and I think I've made this point before to, uh, to me personally, possibly. Uh, listeners and, and other investors whoever wants to listen to my voice it's, it's, <laughs> the reality is was we haven't for the best part of 2022 2023 we hadn't really marketed sovereign in a in, in a way that we're you know kind of engaging the market and investors now previously we were busy doing a pfs we were busy trying to understand the, the resource and importantly for last year we were busy trying to get rio tinto to uh, invest a little bit and become our strategic investor so all of mm. that take takes time and effort and we had a small team around what is essentially one of the biggest finds ever in the in the in the, in the mining industry but you know we're over that we've built the team out we've rio is obviously all you know kind of plugged in and and playing and we are we are engaging the market a bit more we do see you know for example a couple of a couple of uk funds have have been buying on market we know that and uh, you know they're, they're they're building up positions so i think that's that's definitely moving the needle on the uh, share price and and just getting out get, getting the story out there and getting people to understand that this is this is quite an opportunity an investment opportunity is is, is all part and parcel of that well i mean you know obviously cassia you know i feel like a broker i feel like Keir Starmer almost you know my father was a tool maker etc etc but uh you it bears very right, cassia is already you know the largest freestyle deposit the second largest natural flake graphite deposit in the world but you know you're you like, I, I this is my question i mean you, you announced you were doing follow-up drilling to the north of your current asset right within your license foundry have we got any updates on that or is it, is it still ongoing or assays currently being looked at yeah, look, we're doing uh, because we, you know, we're doing everything from the drilling in the north, the pilot mining, uh, some recon drilling back in the south, some infill drilling for the DFS in the mm. future, building out our reserves. It, it, it takes a while, right? Is it, right, I can do. Is it? Well, I guess I'm asking: Is it going to be like a series of RNSs of you know different? Yeah, I'm trying to. Is it going to be all in one, or is it going to be like a series of RNSs throughout uh, the next few months? Uh, you'll see a series of RNSs. You know these are all as much as you know it may be the same team with the same machines, etc. Doing doing the work. You can expect that we will have an RNS on the north. We will have an RNS on infill drilling. We will have an RNS on some of the assay results that we're seeing elsewhere around the, the deposit. So that's for anyone who's very interested in the in the drill bits. I think for me personally, the the, the couple of key things I'd be looking out for as a as a as a sovereign investor would be number one, you know, outcomes from the pilot mine. Yeah, and what we're seeing, having you know, mine this, we'll start hydro mining it very soon. Actually, seeing that in operation will be a big thing. I think it's not yes. very well known outside of sub-Saharan Africa, so uh, people seeing that this this stuff actually works and it's not just complete hokum. Well, yeah, 
and, and then on top of that, you know, we've we've put out a few announcements around our our graphite and the test work that we're doing there. That continues in the background, so we should, you know, we will hopefully update the market on graphite, how it looks and and acts in a battery and and all that kind of good stuff. Well, I mean, we had the update on the 15th of May, you know, entitled Downstream Test Work Shows High Quality Graphite. And essentially what we want to know is, is it going to work in lithium ion batteries, right? Because that's where the money is, it's where the sector demand is. It looks like it's going to at the moment, but obviously more information coming out from that side. I guess, you know, what you were saying, that first point about seeing what comes out of the pilot plant, there's, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is, but there's maybe wariness about unique deposit types, right? Cassia is a unique deposit type. It's this graphite, a rutile, a jewel deposit, and there's nothing like it in the world. And so, which, you know, it is both good and bad because on the one plus side, obviously you might find you have really superior economics and very low energy usage for the amount of material you're going to get out. On the other, people tend to worry, if it was just a classic Hilbernite deposit, for example, it'd probably be a lot less valuable. And yet people will go, yeah, this is definitely viable. So would you say that, you know, once a pilot plant proves that what you think it is, you know, this asset is, does work, you'll probably see a huge rise, both in industry confidence, but also in the share price as well. Would you say? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think so. Look, it's, uh, you're, you're not wrong. And, you know, it, it kind of harks back to the beginning of our conversation that, you know, talking about Rutile and Graphite and Malawi and uniqueness of a deposit and nothing else like it and the biggest and all those kind of good things, lowest cost. And they, they, to your average AIM investor, for example, who's uh, potentially been burnt in the mining industry one or two times before, <laughs> they, they almost ring alarm bells rather than uh, rather than look like green lights. But we are doing everything we can to de-risk this project in every every way, shape or form. And the pilot, the, the, the pilot phase, the pilot mining, the trial rehab, all of that is all part of the part and parcel of it, and 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 of course, as I alluded to, the test work and having MOUs and with future off takers, all of that will be part and parcel of actually just having a, a completely de risk project uh, before we even put you know the first spade in on the ground. Yeah, well, I mean, you say first spade on the ground. I think a lot of investors would be happy just the pilot plant up and running, making money. You don't even sort of like uh, you know that that that's a further stage than many many companies get. You know, and and possibly. I mean, arguably, you've got a lower market cap than companies with, with, you know, nowhere close to what you're doing. I mean, it all seems to be kind of just working out in your favor at the moment. I mean, look, late last month, you know, you were talking about Malawi rail upgrades underway. Obviously, we're talking about the uh, Nicola Logistics Corridor, but the railway goes, it go, does it go through, straight through your license area? It, it actually does. It goes over the absolute southern tip of the resource. Right. So we don't we obviously we don't mind that bit in our uh, in our studies or anything. Well, I wouldn't mind it under the railway personally, but you know. <laughs> that's a good idea. But yes, it does look well, and and we've looked at previously in our scoping study, we looked at trucking product to the nearest uh, the, the nearest rail junction and putting it on the Nicola uh, railway uh, on the PFS. We decided that you know what it's it's a cheaper and more more kind of responsible environmentally to build a six kilometer rail spur so that's what we'll be envisaging for the uh, for the project so you'll have a okay. spur from the, from our gate onto the rail six kilometers that's not a that's not you know a big dink in our in our capex whatsoever mm. i mean i don't know just spitballing here would it be worth doing that while they're upgrading it next door to you just or is, is that something that you think <laughs> i don't know i don't know that they see that already on the side just hang can you just do a little a little side railway for us while you're already here Oh, look, we're, we're part, part and parcel of some of the, the, the drilling and some of the pilot mining is exactly where is we, we, we kind of understand where we want the plant, but the configuration of the plant and all of that still needs to be worked out. And depending on that, you, you know, it will depend on what where the access to, uh, to the plant site and the, the, the processing site will be and, you know, the stockpiles, where do they go, etc. So that's all kind of work in progress. <laughs> It'll be a bit, yeah. bring that up. Decide to build the rail spur before building the plant. And the... No, you'd probably be in trouble, wouldn't you? You know, unless you were guessing very well. I don't know. No, I feel like I'm kind of rambling all over the place. There's been so many developments in the past six months, uh, which, you know, again, why the share price has responded so positively. I mean, I'm going back to the, the graphite. I mean, in late April, you appointed uh, Dr. Surinder, is it Gag? Or Gag? Gag, Gag yeah, I believe it's Gag. Dr. Surinder Gag is G uh, Chief Technology Officer for Graphite. What What's he currently doing at the moment? So he's helping us. So, so so let's just take a step back in terms of graphite and get people to understand it because it is a bit of a kind of a black box. There's lots of kind of urban myths around it and, you know, larger flake is the better and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. 
So when you mine graphite, slate graphite, you end up with a product, a graphite basket of different sizes of flakes in there. So think cornflakes and yeah, get all the different sizes, but the smaller, the smaller stuff gets a lower price than the bigger stuff. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of big stuff gets sold in the market. So if you're talking about having jumbo, super jumbo flakes, and that's going to be your end market, reality is, is that market is very small. There's, there's, there's a few Chinese users of that super jumbo within factory kind of steel making, et cetera. You're not going to make a 25, 30, 40, 50 year business out of selling super jumbos. Yeah. Over the last few years, where has most a flake graphite gone into the lithium ion battery space? Now, lithium ion battery anodes are made from kind of the small to mid size flakes. So yes, they currently sell for less than the jumbo, but there's a much more massive market for those. And the reality is, Charles, is so with, with the economics at Casilla, we're not too fussed that they sell for a lower price because essentially, do having done the, the, the homework and looked at everyone else in the graphite space, we'd be the lowest cost producer of Blake graphite in the world. Like I, country mile, yeah. So if we if we just produce graphite just for the lithium ion battery space you know and we are the largest we would be the largest producer of flake graphite in the world as well that just gives us complete kind of market leadership in that in that sector yeah i mean if it, it feels a little bit like i mean it sounds like a little bit like helium which i you know nothing to do with sovereign but the higher grades of helium is what i've i've been learning if they fetch a lot more money but there's a much smaller market. They're using things like semiconductor manufacturing or laser cutting or MRI machines. Whereas like the lower grades of helium, even though they fetch less money, it's used in way more applications and therefore it's just a lot easier to sell. Is yeah, that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, so look, what, what we're doing is making sure that our graphite is absolutely on point for the end users in the battery space, right? Whether that be battery makers, whether that be OEMs, who, you know, EV manufacturers, the, the whole gamut. And from the flake in the ground that's concentrated by the miner and sold off, to turn that into something that goes into the battery, it needs to be purified. So you take out all yeah. the nasty. That costs money. So the higher the purity, the better. We can get 97.5% purity out of the ground once we've processed it. We've shown that we can purify it to 99.99% purity as well. Mm -hmm. So that means... A lot of the things like sulfur, iron, chromium, alumina, things that you don't want in a battery anode are no longer there or are so minuscule that they make no impact. Once you've purified those flakes, you spherenize them. And what that means is you basically put these uh, flakes into a mill where they uh, slowly overlap one another until they become small balls. Spheres, right? Hence spherenization. Yeah. Those spheres are then coated in what's known as pitch. And that's that that, that coating is the step that we're working on now. So we've shown that our graphite can produce a good concentrate, or one of the best concentrates. It can be purified. It can be spherenized. Now we're doing the coating, and alongside the coating, once it's coated, it is essentially the anode active material. We'll stick it in in, in lithium-ion batteries and see what it does if we, you know, charge this battery up and use it a thousand times. What does that mean for for, for the battery compared to what's on the market right now? And and we should have that those kind of details out to the market uh, pretty soon. Good, good. I mean, well, it's, it's all sounding very exciting. I mean, with this pilot plant operation, I'm not going to go massively into depth on it because I feel like uh, we'd be here for the next 400 years. <laughs> These, I've got, it's kind of a multi-question. The first is, to, obviously, you're working with Rio Tinto. So it's, they're not just a shareholder. They're also, it's a joint technical committee. To what extent is Rio Tinto kind of I don't know, leading the pilot operation or, you know, how much input do they have on it? And then the second part of the question, I mean, all these consultants you've got together, so like Motor Engine, Fraser Alexander, Epoch, DRA Global. So these guys are helping with the pilot plant. Are they also going to be the engineers who build the main thing in the future? Or are you keeping your options open? The, the, the view is anyone who is assisting us on the pilot mine will obviously have the knowledge and the expertise to build out the whole thing. Yeah, we have used um, these consultancies and, and engineering firms throughout the process of developing Casia. In terms of Rio Tinto, when, we, when they came on board uh, last year, we signed two agreements with them. 
there's a subscription agreement, which was the 15% shares plus the options, which they've now exercised. So that takes them up to the 19.76%. At the same time as signing the subscription agreement, we signed the uh, what was termed an investment agreement. And that has all the clauses of how we work together with Sovereign. And one of those key points is we have a technical committee with them, three members of Sovereign, three members of Rio, but Sovereign has casting votes on that technical committee. So what that means is essentially what, what we do in terms of a pilot plant, the, the, the whole scope around it is all from Sovereign and its team, but with the input of of Rio's understanding and years of having done this and, and the right individuals within Rio giving us the, the, the right assistance and advice. So essentially, I mean, I, th- I think if you look at most recent oh. RNS, you'll read that, you know, the the investment agreement between Sovereign and Rio basically just makes sure that Rio continues to provide assistance and advice on technical and importantly, marketing aspects of Casia. I mean, it's it, it, it's kind of, I don't know what, what the word, obviously Sovereign it owns Casia. That's it. Rio is a large investor. And yet Rio's expertise and specifically in the titanium space it just just so useful, you know. Forgetting the investment aside, marketing, yes. But I feel like you you, you might you might find that you're um, trying to think of the words. You're you're jumping three steps ahead from where you would have been if you didn't have them on board. Did you pursue you then specifically as an investor in the company before you know June twenty twenty three or whenever it was they came in, or were you looking at like a multitude of companies? No, look, the the as as soon as we uh, started making noises about what we had found, a a real Rutile deposit within a saprolite, free dig and freely liberated. You can imagine anyone who has anything to do with titanium started knocking on the door. Yeah. Asking. We signed, you know, we signed three MOUs before Rio even came in. Yeah, you did. Uh, yeah. On one with Hascor, who are who are big in the welding space. Of course, thirty percent of of all Rutile ends up in welding. Hascor currently takes or took. I don't know what the current conditions are, but it, it was one of the big customers of Sierra Rutile. And that's where they they get their retail product that they then market and sell across the US and and, and globally. We signed an MOU with Chemos, the which is uh, the uh, NYSE listed uh, company. They're you know big chemicals company, but they also are the world's biggest producer of high quality titanium pigment. Mm. So we tick the box on you know we can we can use our retail within the pigment sphere. And not just any pigment, but high quality pigment. And then we signed an MOU with uh, with uh, Mitsui, you know, the seventy billion dollar Japanese trading house. And you know, their their remit is go out and secure supply of raw materials that Japanese industry requires to produce all the goods. Simple as that, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So, so when you have the likes of Toho Titanium or Osaka Titanium in in Japan, who are two of the biggest kind of aerospace grade titanium metal producers out there. Outside of China, outside of Russia, they're harking on about building out their uh, their their supply, you know, doubling, tripling capacity, all that kind of good stuff. Obviously, you need the raw materials. So, 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 oh, no, so you say obviously. I mean, so, so 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 many companies don't seem to have got that yet. You know, we're going to have this like this massive AI boom, for example. But you know, where's the copper coming on from? That we don't know. We'll figure that out later. Titanium, yeah. it's the same thing. No one seems to have figured it out. It were rutile. There isn't any left. Is there? Yeah, and it's a good point. I'm in the US next week at a few conferences, meeting a few investors, and one of the key things, having been there quite a few times in the last uh, few months, is you know obviously you you speak rutile and, and they start questioning it as soon as you say this is you know the highest uh, grade purest form of of titanium mineral. They get it immediately because you know the US has been do, uh, has been making a lot of noise around titanium. I think it was the US Bureau of Industry and Security. Recently put out a paper saying titanium is essential for U.S. defense systems, but also yeah. 16 out of 16 of the critical infrastructure sectors, well, right? You're starting to see it with like grant funding. Yeah. You know, it's unlikely Sovereign would get any, but grant funding in the U.S. for various projects and just critical minerals. They're building up the stockpiles again. It seems to be back on top of the political agenda, you know, regardless. Yeah. Correct. And then and then what, what happened, you know, that's just the titanium side of the story. And then you've got graphite where the White House put a 25% tariff on all graphite coming from China. China, yeah. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you've got, you know, this, this huge deposit that can last for decades, able to supply both titanium feedstock and graphite to anyone who's listening. 
it's just so wonderful, isn't it? It just, it just seems to be, I mean, honestly, yes, you work really hard, right? And not just you, obviously the company in general, but um, maybe to an extent you were lucky to find something so amazing, right? Obviously you're very good explorers, but you're lucky that the railway is being upgraded right, you know, over your land. You're lucky that the, the confluence of politics, you know, and the political atmosphere that we have is working in your favour. It seems to be you're, 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 it's just really good timing you know, just in general for this particular asset. Yeah, and I think usually with the with these type of assets, you do find that's the case. You know, whether you're a Boise's Bay or an Olympic Dam or a Grassberg or anything. Yeah, it, yeah. Parts just seem to align at the right time for, for these things. And not to say there won't be hiccups, there won't be, you know, bumps in the road. Well, but there should, if, if you don't report any, that's when I'll start being worried, you know? No, and look, we're... we're all of this is all about optimizing Casio ready for uh, ready for production, right? So when you've got an asset this this kind of size and throwing off potential kind of economics that it that the PFS alluded to, the fact that you can be market leader in not not one but two critical mineral supply chains, madness. It, it's important that you get it all right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm going to finish yeah. this kind of grilling that I've given you. I hope you've enjoyed it, but maybe a little bit of grilling. Yeah, you guys, I mean, do you really think there's any prospect in this company? From no, this I, think, you know, yeah, I, I think, think, I think it has got a chance, to be honest with you. No, I think you've got no, a chance as well. No, do you know, do you um, know, some, I, do the thing is, Kev, is that honestly, like, uh, sometimes, like, I'll, I'll grow a CEO and, like, that there are, like, chinks in the armour or there's issues with the company, right? And often that's reflected in the share price, so that's fine. But with this particular one, I just, I, I just can't see the downside. It's just, it's just... No matter which way it goes, it's just going to be wonderful. So, Pan, I guess I'm going to finish with ESG, essentially, right? Because I think this is also really important. Now, obviously, we can talk about how kind of low energy, how how low the energy is going to be getting these you know, minerals out of the ground. But Malawi, you know, is, is a relatively poor country. I don't know that much about the jurisdiction. I know that you've got really good connections with the government there and everyone seems to be very much on board. Uh, what kind of environmental social governance steps are you taking to ensure that you're bringing a net positive to the country? We've made a bit of a song and dance about this, but it's only because we as a team and with our partner Rio Tinto understand you can't you can't build huge corporations in countries, you know, in host countries without any kind of real engagement with local communities, without mm. those local communities. And and supporting those local communities is just part and parcel of what we as sovereign metals do. So you know, you, you would have seen that we've this year we kicked off a conservation farming program. The social team within Sovereign is the former social team for First Quantum in Zambia, who are also the the, the, the team that helped Rangold in the DRC. So they've got a lot of experience of dealing with I didn't know that. Anyone company yeah, as social strategies so so we've got this conservation farming program just to put a bit of context into that what does that essentially mean look we've taken we've taken 90 local farmers who farm on the ground that we'd be mining we've shown them and trained them and taught them ways of farming known as conservation farming which uses less irrigation less kind of you much more mulching things like that and what we've seen even before the harvest was that they were they were getting crop yields on their maize so so you know corn they, they were achieving anywhere between three and eight times what wow. they now what they normally get is enough to feed their family for nine months with three months of let's just see what happens right that's how let's be honest that's how the real world works right outside of our, our lovely kind of that's okay. yeah. uh, right we, we are the minority in this in the on this planet the majority deals with life like that for us to go in and be able to help them produce enough crops at a time of essentially drought within Southern Africa as well, yeah. right? That they can A, produce enough to feed their family, year, you know, all year round, but also start selling that and, and, and kind of bringing in some kind of commercialization into like the local the local farming farming world. You know, that's quite quite important for us. And so you, you, you probably saw an announcement that we made a few weeks ago that uh, we signed an MOU with a group called Palladium, yeah, which is backed by uh, USAID. So, you know, the biggest kind of foreign kind of, uh, you know, I impact and, uh, and development entity in the world. They funded Palladium and we're collaborating with Palladium to develop agriculture value chains within, within Malawi. So all of that should, you know, help those farmers whose land we are essentially, you know, borrowing over time before we yeah. give it 
in a state that is as good as, if not better than we're, what they found it as. So, so you know, for us, the, that that's just one of the social initiatives we're doing. And we're doing other things like education scholarships, you know, or, or diversity and inclusion within our own Malawi labs, for example. We have 80 Malawi Malawians working in our lab, most of which are women today. So we're a real, real company doing real things on the ground, and we want to make a real change to the people on the ground as well. That's fantastic to hear because that funds into my very last question before we say goodbye. If you, if this was deposit in, was in Zambia, for example, or Zimbabwe, there would probably be a you know a fair amount of very skilled labour, right, and and you know possibly more infrastructure. Do do you foresee there being any issues getting just the manpower, the skilled manpower you need to run the mine that you're planning to build in the future, or is that something that you think Rio Tinto will be able to help out with? Both both of those are correct. Look, before we even got to Malawi, it, there were there was no understanding of metallurgy around Ruta. There was no understanding or real understanding of you know separation of of graphite flakes through a flotation process. And all these are things that we we've taught you know we've helped coach the locals and and train them in understanding this type of stuff. So the thing about Malawi is as much as it is yes, it is a poor country. It's a poor country ready for development, ready for education, ready for training, ready for understanding, ready to support businesses, you know, to come over, teach the locals how to do this. According to the PFS, we'd have about a thousand direct employees just in the construction phase. There will be a phase of coaching and training that's all built into our, into plan. our, our plans. But we, 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 we foresee that, you know, this will be a Malawian project run mainly by Malawians in the future. Wow. Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna press you further on Rio Tinto or buyouts or anything like that because I feel like you won't be able to answer. I did say that was my last question, but one just thought popped into my head. Various media outlets, I'm not gonna name them, are starting to compare what you have to the growth potential that Fortescue saw back in the day when it was a much smaller company. Any comment on that? How how far do you think this could thing could go? Firstly, I'm going to sound like uh, most of our politicians do and not answer the question directly. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't, but I had to ask. It's not the new there, Sapan, let's be honest. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's it, it's quite telling how the market's uh, finally perceiving us. But I think, you know, as I said before, Casilla is a once in a lifetime find. You don't you don't really come across these. And and you're right, we were, uh, you know, there was some serendipity to finding this this project it's not like we went into malawi thinking yes you know our phd thesis says that there's going to be a root of graphite deposit here we were in malawi looking for graphite the graphite that we were processing kept having high grades of titanium in there and then we started looking for the titanium and ended up tripping over the biggest find in in, in the country so you know there, there there is some serendipity to it and as you said you know it, it, it does help that the macro is aligning with those with those commodities uh, so you can see why people are making those parallels as i said you know, before you know our plan is just to get this get this through product uh, through through to production and and we're going to continue with that head on if anything else happens in in the meantime we'll deal with that then so in summary i'll translate for you guys if you're listening they're going to sell this for a large amount of money to Rio Tinto, a massive titanium major. And then Sapan, Kev, Phil and I are all going to go to the beach and have cocktails. About right? Perfect. Wonderful. Well, yeah, it's been lovely to chat right. to you, Sapan. Southern Comfort, lemonade and lime. It's cool. well, that's fair. Nice. I'll be having a, uh, what do I What do I like? A Key West cooler when I'm on holiday. A little bit of Midori at the bottom. Malibu and Archer, the orange juice, and then vodka and cranberry juice at the top. Slice of orange. Foam. And Sapan, what would be your cocktail of choice? Oh, look, I, I, I've stayed away from the carbs for about a month, so I just want a beer, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think uh, you'll all agree, you are listening, that this has been yeah. very informative. We found out quite a bit more about the salt and metals from uh, Sapan. Thanks for all the questions, Charles. And I refer you to Charles's article as well. He's written an article in the last few days. That's gone out, so check that out. What's the website they can check that out? Uh, this one is the miningaim.co.uk, but I'll put it out on Twitter, Telegram, everywhere. You'll be able to find it very easily. Okay, so you will have seen the article, and now you can listen to what's been said as well. So we hope it's been useful for you all, informative, and uh, yeah, I think you've got a few prospects, Sapan, so let's see how it all comes up. Thanks, Jan. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful. 
This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.